are going. So thank you for letting us record this presentation. We will be sharing these out um, with links for folks too, so that um, after a while we'll get those out to you so that you can view them again or share them with others if you'd like. So welcome to the first of our positioning theory virtual series for 2024. We had a little bit of a break uh, in the fall where we were still trying to get the handbook uh, finished and pulled together for the publisher. So we didn't get these restarted as soon as we wanted, but um, we're in process now. I'd just like to acknowledge um, the support that we received from the University of Buffalo for helping to uh, do this series. And also I should introduce myself for those of you who may not know me. Um, I'm Mary McVie, and I'm here today uh, with Luke Van Langenhove, who you'll hear from in a few minutes <clears throat> as well to talk about the first chapter. So just a few announcements before we get started. And I apologize if um, this doesn't go quite as smoothly. I'm working off of a couple of uh, different computers today. Um, the, per the positioning theory virtual series, just a reminder to share this out um, with others and to, uh, to register and to also um, invite anyone else <clears throat> who may be interested. The registration document that links to the Google Doc I've put into the chat for you. And please feel free. Actually, I think I just put the conference. This is the problem of working across multiple platforms and trying to share out things at the same time. Um, and I'm not particularly good at multitasking. I'm gonna do this again, make sure I put the virtual the virtual talks link in um, there. And then also a reminder for the positioning theory conference, because that is also coming up. Those proposals are due on February 15th and they will be reviewed. Um, we also, a posse Hervonen who's hosting it, this at the University of Eastern Finland, I said that the, they're working on the website and getting out information about costs and other information, um, which should be coming uh, very soon. So that is the information about the conference. And if you have any questions, um, please please reach out. You can um, email through um, the information on the poster, or you can always contact. Mary McVie at the University of Buffalo. We are also looking for some help uh, with our social media and looking for someone who might be interested uh, to act as a volunteer liaison to work with the planning committee for the conference, but also to work with the virtual series folks and to help with the planning team to get out information on different parts of social media. We do think it would be helpful. The team usually meets on uh, Friday uh, mornings at 9 a.m. Eastern time U.S., um, so roughly at the same time, but typically on some Fridays, not every Friday. So some availability that intersects with that time would be uh, would be helpful. And if you're interested, um, there's a there's a another link to a Google form that I put in it in the chat so that you could um, put some information in and we will get in contact with you. These types of positions are, um, I work with the American Education Research Association. We've done something very similar for the social semiotics SIG. And at various iterations, we've had um, early career folks or um, even graduate students who are in these positions. It's a great opportunity to network with some scholars in the field. And it, it should not be um, hugely demanding in terms of time. We create the content. We just need someone to help with some of these different things and pushing, um, pushing things, things out. So if you're interested, um, please check out that Google form and let us, let us know or if you have questions. Okay, so 
here is why we are really here today, um, to hear about the Rutledge International Handbook of Positioning Theory. We will talk about the we will talk about the first chapter of it, but just to give you a little bit of information about the handbook. Um, and the one thing I didn't do was um, copy that link to put into the into the chat, but you can find this on the Rutledge website. Oops. Um, the official title is the Rutledge International Handbook of Positioning Theory. Um, Part one focuses on conceptual foundations and explorations and has a numbers of chapters in that. Part two focuses on methods and analytic frameworks. And part three um, focuses on applications across a variety of disciplinary topics. And the last part has a small section on future directions and reflections. And we're really hoping that um, this handbook will help for many of us who've been working with positioning theory for, um, for a while have found that whether it's for our own explorations or working with uh, doctoral students or other, um, other scholars in the field, that there hasn't been a go-to source to help bring ideas together. And so we're hoping that this starts that process. We already have a list of things that we think need to go in the second edition of the handbook. So um, we know that this is incomplete, but we're hoping that this will be a start. I believe that this should be out by the summer of 2024. Uh, we don't have an exact date on that yet, but we'll keep um, updating um, on these as we get further information um, on that. So today we're going to be talking about chapter one. This is an introduction to positioning theory past and present. And what we've tried to do is to um, provide an overview, an introduction, a place that, that people who want to learn about positioning theory, its history and what it is, uh, could go to as a, as a resource, a primer. And it, of course, it um, it's incomplete. There's much more that could be said, but at least it is one place that we're trying to put um, some of that history together and to, to um, hopefully continue to build on across time. So as I mentioned, um, Luke Van Langenhove is here with us today, so he'll be talking in just a moment. Uh, before we uh, Before we turn things over to Luke, just a couple of things about this chapter. This chapter focused, the goals of this were to explore the history, foundations, origins, and development of positioning theory, to provide an overview of the theory while situating it in the wider, wider work of Ram um, Hare and his collaborators. So this includes folks like um, Bronwyn Davies, who the piece that is most often cited from the Journal of Theory of Social Behavior, but also other collaborators. If you followed um, the, the work that Hare has done, you've probably noticed he's collaborated very widely with a number of folks. So we, we talk about that as well as the influences and work of um, Bronwyn Davies and Ram Hare to trace how and why positioning became an object of study and to serve as an anchor for the handbook and chapters to follow, and really to serve as an introductory text on positioning theory to where people could go as a resource. There are three sections in the chapter. Um, there, the first section really deals with these early works on positioning theory and scholars of positioning and early texts by Hare and other collaborators. Section two, we'll be talking about the roots and branches of the positioning tree. Some of you have probably seen this figure before. And then we also did an analysis of uptake on positioning theory in the social sciences. One of the interesting things about positioning theory is how um, cross-disciplinary it is. It's been picked up in lots of different fields. And so we did some analysis and looking at like where and how is this being taken, um, taken up. And the last section of the chapter deals with positioning theory today and the emergence of various concepts over time. You'll also see I put a, um, 
a section four up here in the corner, which actually isn't in this first introductory chapter, but is part of the last chapter of the handbook. But we'll point to some of the things that are in that chapter as well as just a means of accessing future directions. So at this point, I'm going to turn things over to um, over to Luke. I'd remind you too that um, if you have questions along the way that you think of, uh, you can post those in the chat. We'll try to monitor them um, as we can, and we should have some time for questions uh, at the at the end. But uh, feel free to put those in, and we'll try to we'll try to monitor them along the way as well. So at this point, Luke, I'm going to turn things over to you for section one. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mary. And good uh, morning, good afternoon, good whatever part of the day you're in. It's, it's wonderful to have a big audience uh, like for this. So I'm, I'm going to talk about what we call the origins of positioning theory, which basically means that I want to tell you a story about the, what we call, what I call, the intellectual origins for the theory, for formulating the theory. And as Mary already said, a crucial aspect here is the uh, article that Ron Henry wrote together with Brown and Davis, but there are many other uh, issues to be mentioned as well. And the, the whole issue is that the early conceptual development of positioning has been a very collaborative and interdisciplinary endeavor. And this creates, in a way, a kind of challenge to, to really trace the origins and the foundational sources of inspiration for what has become known today as positioning theory. Uh, there are two challenges. The first one is that if you really want to understand, grasp the meaning of positioning theory as developed by Ron Harry, you, could, you should not only read the texts that are dealing with positioning theory, but you have to look at the whole work, the whole oeuvre of Rom Harry. Rom Harry was a philosopher of science, and he was concerned with, with ontology of the world, how to study the world, the scientific methods, not only in the social sciences, but also in the natural sciences. And then he tried to apply it to many different fields, and social psychology is being one of them. But again, my advice is, uh, if you're interested in positioning theory, read as much as you can the other work of Rom Harry as well. The second challenge is that the concept of position is uh, in a way, pro well, not problematic, is, is difficult to grasp because it has a kind of household, uh, let's say, character. We all seem to know a little bit what positioning means. And indeed, in many different aspects of the, the society, we can see that people refer to the word position and positioning as uh, taken for granted. You can talk about, let's say, military endeavors uh, in terms of troops that are taking a certain position, that are defending a position, etc. Uh, you see it in marketing, where we have product placement, uh, even on the, the, the shelves of shops, where let's say people have different uh, products have different positions in the, the things that are for sale in the, in the shop. Or it can also be that the concept of position in marketing terms refers to, let's say, the, uh, the, the stages that the product is given. A uh, classical example is uh, Belgian beer called Stella Artois, which is positioned in Belgium as a normal everyday lager beer. But in other countries, the same beer, exactly the same beer, is positioned as a luxury item. So because of that, well, and then was you have the classical joke that people always tell me if I try to explain them what is positioning and positioning theory, they say, ah, uh, does it also apply to the Kama Sutra? But I will not uh, go into details about that. Uh, but the fact that we have these different perceptions about position gives it a kind of false, uh, let's say, uh, face validity. People think very easily, ah, yes, I know what position and positioning theory is, but it's much more complex than that. Now, uh, what I want to do is first tell something about 
what I call the pre-history of positioning theory. Because whenever you develop a certain concept, a certain theoretical stance on how you think the world looks like, you can be sure that there are others that have done more or less the same as you have done before. A classical example here is uh, if you say you're interested in, in the, the psychodynamics, as, as Sigmund Freud with psychoanalysis once did, then and he came up with this idea that the human mind could be pictured uh, by three things, the ego, the it, and the superego. And if you look carefully uh, to the works of Plato, you can already find that in, in the story that Plato tells about the, the mind being pictured as two horses, one with a lot of temperament, the it, one uh, with restraining horses, and then you have the horse rider who tries to cope with both uh, horses. It's a story, of course, but some people say that that is the essence that Freud captured from Plato and that he transformed transferred in his own thinking. Um, what I would consider to do here is say, well, in the prehistory of positioning theory, there is one name that is crucial. And surprisingly, that name is that of Sir Isaac Newton, who published in 1687 his Principia Mathematica. And in that book, he paved the groundwork for what today we call the classic mechanics or the Newtonian classic mechanics, a theory that says that, okay, for every object we have on Earth and around, we can determine its position, and which is the location in space, and we can determine its velocity, which is location in time. If an object moves, it will continue to move in a straight line until there is kind of uh, some force, some power that is acting upon that object. So if you throw a stone away, that object will follow a certain trajectory. And Newton, the genius of Newton was that he found out how to calculate the entire trajectory of that stone based upon its position, its velocity, and the forces that are acting upon it. Now, I think we can say that Newtonian mechanics has been one of the greatest scientific achievements of all time. And the Newtonian equations uh, allowed people to account for many different things in the universe, from the orbits of the planets around the sun to the falling apples, as the story goes with Newton. So we shouldn't be surprised then that from there on, the concept of position made its way to everyday language. And gradually, it became a metaphor to talk about the social view as well. And in the volume, in the handbook, we have the chapter by Michael Bamberg, who explores that kind of using position as metaphors. But the interesting, for, uh, the interesting thing for us is that the Newtonian look at the universe combined with Hume's concept of causality uh, became a kind of ideal model of explanation for the social sciences. Later on, that would be called positivist positivism. And it's precisely in the context of the critique that Harley formulated on the Newtonian Humean take on causality, that he introduced this idea that, well, in the social sciences, in social psychology, in psychology, it's not causality that should be central, but meaning. Meaning means that we focus upon a discursive real, and that should be at the center of the social sciences. And this opens the road for a very different approach to psychology. You're not looking for causality, you're looking for meaning, and it opens the road to the, the door for what we call the moral approach on psychology and on social sciences. And I will come back to that moral aspect later on. So from there, and this is of course a story, and by all means, uh, I don't think Rom, Rom Harry himself would ever compare him with Rick Newton, but it's a way to picture the whole thing. And the interesting thing for me is that in the famous book, The Explanation of Social Behavior, that Ron Harry wrote together with uh, Paul Sackett, they talk a lot about the Newtonian classical mechanics and the alternative that they formulated for studying the social sciences. Now, the second thing then is that from there, concepts of positioning has been picked up 
by a number of different scholars in the social sciences, trying to formulate uh, ways of presenting the work of, uh, no, presenting the, let's say, the, a different look, a different take on how to picture the social world. And one of the names that has, stands out here is uh, the name of Michel Foucault. And there are quite some authors that have attributed the origin of using positioning in the social sciences to the work of uh, Michel Foucault. And one of them was definitely uh, Wendy Holway, who uh, it was probably, and I guess the first one to actually attribute positioning to Foucault. But there are others that have done the same thing. Uh, one interesting name I found is Anthony Giddens, the British sociologist, who on different occasions referred to positions and positioning in his own. And then quite amazingly, perhaps, is that you find hardly any references to the work of Ron Harry in Anthony Giddens and vice versa. Uh, and Ron Harry did not refer to um, kids either, although they knew each other and they met on several occasions. You have to go back in history a little bit, uh, let's say somewhere beginning of the 70s, 1970s, mid 70s, where Ron Harry was uh, in Oxford and uh, he was a full time professor there affiliated to the Department of uh, Philosophy in Merton Street. But his college, Lineker College, was located on South Park Road, just opposite the uh, Department of Psychology. And here's something interesting happened. Because the Psychology Department was, I believe, uh, on the second floor of a modern building, and on the first floor was the Biology Department, where a famous biologist and then journalist also, if you want, uh, uh, Desmond Norris was uh, teaching and uh, had his office. And Desmond Norris was one of these people who said, well, if you want to understand the way human beings behave and how they function, we should use the methods of observing animals, the ethological methods uh, and the anthropological methods to uh, look at the functioning of, of people. Uh, Desmond Norris was the author of a famous book in those days called uh, The Naked Ape, where he tried to do that kind of things. Now, Harry, from his side, was gradually discovering the experimental social psychology uh, that was led by different people in, in Oxford. The director of the, the department was Michael Arkay, who was into doing lots of research on the basis of small questionnaires and tasks that they gave to people in, in artificial situations. And Harry immediately saw that there was a kind of uh, contradiction between the complexity and the simplicity of the tasks on the one hand, complexity that is, if you consider the whole situation, but simplicity, the way it was reduced to yes, no uh, things. And he thought that it would be good to have an alternative, and that alternative was uh, what he called the etogenic way of looking to people, the etogenic way that put conversations at the core of the things that we should study, and also next to conversations, the force of speech acts. And there is a whole history to, to tell about the, the way that in the Department of Psychology, the thinking of Ron Harry became gradually accepted as uh, an alternative way of doing psychological research. And it is in that context that we have to uh, focus, that we have to understand how uh, Ron Harry gradually, step by step, came to the idea that positioning is very important. And the crucial early development here was the publication by a Brussels psychiatrist called Jean-Pierre de Waal and uh, Rom Harry in 1976 uh, about what they called the personality of individuals. And they produced a model of persons and what persons do. And the whole idea was that they see personality 
as a kind of set of resources that people use to cope with standard situations and things that they can mobilize for dealing with non-standard situations. They have, for instance, a very nice uh, thought experiment. If you have two people walking on a mountain path and one they are approaching each other, then the question is who should stop and who should let the other go first. And you can then think of, of certain components by uh, these people, but also that if there is no convention, that they can think of a rule that has to be applied. For instance, if there is a female and male uh, walker that come together on that narrow walking path, that the male uh, person says, well, ladies first, and he lets the ladies go, which can be seen as positioning the other walking person as in a certain way. And that person can then object or not object to that. So it's dealing with non-standard situations that is the core issue of how to assign and take what we call nowadays positions. And that was developed in the article in 1976. And very interestingly, it was also said in that same article that, that there was an approach that was to be compared with roles. But they mentioned very clearly that the concept of role has a number of drawbacks and that an alternative should be developed. That sentence or that idea that positions should be posed to roles and should be seen as a kind of refinement of the role concept is something that pops up in quite a lot of other positioning theory publications by Rob Harry later on. So you could see that the, the, the gist of the thinking in terms of positioning was there, although in the 1976 article, the concept of position, positioning theory was not used at all. And then came the famous article by Bronwyn Davis and Rob Harry that really sparked the interest in uh, positioning theory. Uh, I'm not going to talk uh, too much. But it indeed was a kind of eye opener for a lot of people who read it uh, at that time, uh, saying that, uh, and I see that indeed there is a typo on the screen. It was published in 90s, in 1990, but not in 99. Uh, that article was of such a nature that a lot of people recognized. It and said, yes, of course, that is what's happening and that should be done. And I was one of them uh, because at that moment when it was published, I happened to do a sabbatical uh, in uh, Oxford with Rome. And uh, when he handed over the article to me, he said, have a look at it and uh, see if we can do something more because I have the feeling that there is something here uh, important that uh, can be further developed, which then gave birth to the article that I wrote together with Rome and that was a kind of variety of positioning, that was a kind of systematization of the whole theory. Um, what happened then is that some other people jumped on our little bandwagon and started to work with, with Rome uh, on developing the idea of position and positioning theory in several occasions. I myself, I, I wrote a couple of articles with Rom on stereotypes, and the use of positioning theory to understand the production of scientific texts, etc., etc. And then finally, in 1999, we indeed uh, added together that uh, book, also known these days as the Purple Book, Positioning Theory, Moral Context of Intentional Action. And there you see that indeed we refer in the title already to the whole issue of the moral context and the, the idea that there are moral orders that uh, should be regarded when thinking of uh, positioning. Now, I'm going to end here, but just quickly say that in the proliferation of the writing about positions, it went uh, in different directions. It started with interactions and conversations, then the, uh, the scope was broadened to intergroup relations, 
to identity narratives, to education research, a lot of education research. Mary will talk about that later, but also to the study of international relations and even regional integration studies. And then you had more and more authors that came along and, and the key person here to mention is, is the work that Ali Mogadam has done. And the people that carefully look to the chronology of the articles will notice that uh, after my original articles, I somehow disappeared from the positioning scene. And that is simply because I took upon, upon uh, me another job as a civil servant. And uh, I had no time, unfortunately, to work on positioning theory anymore. But what did happen at the same time was that there were quite a lot and more and more PhD students that used or, and are using uh, positioning theory as a framework for their PhD research. Mary mentions that indeed Michael Bamberg is also named, and of course Mary herself is uh, of key persons, crucial persons in the development of positioning theory. One final thing to, to end this little historical uh, overview, which you can see here uh, in the summary table that we produced for the handbook, is that um, in 1993, there was published by Harry the second edition of one of his core books, The Social Being Called, which has as a subtitle, A Theory for Social Psychology. And uh, there he more or less explains the whole issue of what positions and positioning theory is with one interesting connotation that is that he doesn't refer to the literature that was already available in 93. I have no idea why this is the case, but uh, I just want the author to, to signal it. So that's where we are with the intellectual sources. So to summarize it all, it's an endeavor that was carried out by lots of people. And it is an idea that has been ripening uh, over time in the minds of Ron Harry and also the different collaborators he worked with together. Uh, let's go over to the second part and I give the floor then again to Murray. And by the way, when we are finished, there will be, of course, possibilities to ask questions about all this. Thank you. I think, Mary? okay. Um, what you see on the screen is probably a little difficult to read if your screen is small, but I wanted to just put this in here as a placeholder. Um, this is a table that uh, started in previous publications, but we've been adapting, which presents like core ideas over the years in various volumes by um, Hooray and collaborators, so including Davies and Hooray, and then moving on to some of the works that Luke mentioned. So I won't delve into that at all, but there are things like this in the chapter that should be helpful in orienting people towards um, positioning theory, particularly if they're not you know, familiar with that, as well as the historical context that Luke has been talking about. And He's given just a brief glimpse into that historical process. The, the chapter does go into more details um, about that. So just an update on, uh, we did include the positioning tree, and then we also looked at some of the uptake in the social uh, sciences. So this is a figure that some of you may have seen before. Uh, we developed it. Um, a few years back, um, I developed this with a few of uh, my graduate student collaborators. And what we did for the handbook was engaged in further conversations, particularly as Luke and I were working on this first chapter and thinking about how can we refine this and think about this a little a little bit further. So there are some additions to this figure that weren't here before. Um, we, we've put a hallway on here and these roots and branches, um, are not, we've just tried to put the various names and various influences here, but the, there's no size comparison. So if somebody's on a, on a bigger root or, um, branch, it doesn't necessarily mean there's more importance there, but we've 
we've got that. Uh, obviously, there's a very important influence from feminist post-structuralism, the work of Hallway, and obviously Bronwyn Davies' work as well. And you see Davies up here on her own branch. She really um, talks about the development of positioning in ways that align with that, but also her work, which was very situated in the lives of children in classrooms, really influenced her work. And we, we talk about that some in this chapter, but there's also a later chapter that delves into narrative analysis and influences. And uh, Davy's work is really important there as well. And I won't talk about that today, but there is another chapter that delves into some of that work, as well as further influences from Michael Bamberg um, and folks who were influential in that narrative discourse strand. And you see Michael Bamberg is at the top of this over here, as well as Hooray, um, Ali Mogadam's work in inner, um, in peace relations and peace and conflict studies, and then also Luke Van Langenhove, who you've already heard from. Uh, we've tried to articulate in the figure that um, that where positioning theory came from had influences from lots of different diff different disciplines both in the work of Ram Hooray and various collaborators, but also in people who continue this. So some of those major areas of philosophy, linguistics, speech act theory, um, social psychology, sociology, and some names that you've already heard Luke mention, people like Foucault, but also influences from um, Wittgenstein and Austin and Cyril Vygotsky, uh, Giddens, who um, Luke mentioned, who often isn't cited in uh, Hare's work, but is um, there's very parallel themes there, as well as others like um, Bakhtin. And I had an interesting conversation as well as we were preparing the handbook with Michael Bamberg. And one of the things that Michael and I were talking about is here we have a we have a particular tree uh, that represents sort of the growth and development, or one take, one metaphor for positioning theory, but. We could also think about this as an entire forest or ecosystem. If you've ever read about, for example, aspen groves in the US, these are considered many trees, but they're actually considered like one living organism altogether. So we could think of this also as like, what are, you know, what's in that forest? What's in that ecosystem? So it shouldn't just be like this one thing here by itself, but theories are meant to be a living, flexible, adaptable. And I think that uh, we can think about that as we as we continue to go forward and have conversations um, around this. So we've got some explanation of this in the chapter uh, as, <clears throat> as well. Um, I wanna just talk about a little bit of what we did with relation to looking at influences in social science. So what, what I did for this was looked at the web of science and pulled information. This is from uh, November of 2023. And at that time, there were, according to the Web of Science, uh, 2,727 publications that are citing um, that are citing uh, Davies and and Hooray. And you see that this growth over time, and you can see this the um, the number of publications and the number of citation goes up. It has a drop off here. Um, I think the first time I showed this to to Luke, he said, oh no, do we have a problem? Because like all of a sudden no one is <laughs> no one is citing this, but that it's the same kind of thing that you see in other indices like a Google Scholar profile where the more recent citations or publications take a while to take a while to catch up. I think if you look at um, different feeds for references and citations or work in the field, you see that this is really there's a very healthy interest in positioning theory. We take a particular year, like 2019, uh, there were 218 publications listed in the Web of Sciences citing the original uh, piece from 1990 by Davies and Hooray, which is a total of, of uh, 4,600 citations. So about 21 citations within those different publications. What What's interesting about about this is that it shows, I think, this um, rapid expansion. I've been following these figures. I first started by looking at um, the Journal for the Theory of Social Behavior because they used to keep um, the references on their, um, on their site. And 
I started looking at those and he had actually gone through at one point and looked at those references and called out once for education before we had access to web of science. And what we realized quickly in following some of these is it's very hard to keep up with all the citations, with all the new publications coming out. So I think what that what that indicates to us is that there's there is an interest in this, and there's also an interest across different areas. And that's another thing that um, we looked at a little bit. We can see that if we pull this and look at different areas, and again, this was based on web of science and analysis on the Davies and Hooray 1990 piece. So we weren't looking at other types of references uh, or um, the books or those types of things. But what was interesting to us is you can just see as this goes across, like where are the different disciplines and fields where this is having interest? It's been picked up very strongly in education um, and it's difficult to say exactly why that is. I, I think part of it's because a lot of education is so um, interdisciplinary. People work across disciplines, um, across you know, a lots of things. I think that appeal that we see broadly across all of the positioning theory applications um, shows up in education because it is by nature across disciplines. Uh, the second area that, that it was picked up most widely according to Web of Science is psychology in the behavioral sciences, linguistics, communication, uh, sociology, and then um, social sciences and other categories and business economics, as well as healthcare. So again, I think what's interesting about this is that we have, we have a very strong representation across different disciplines. And I think people are doing um, a lot of work that's really interesting. It also speaks to the need to also continue to uh, develop conversations across different areas. Um, I can say that even within uh, within education, I review a lot of pieces that have to do with positioning theory. And one of the things that I notice is that even within education, sometimes even within the same kind of area or a, an adjacent area, people aren't necessarily always reading beyond their small circle. And I think to really have a robust development of theory and conversation, it's important to engage in um, reading inside our areas, but also reading outside those as well and continuing to have conversations. Um, our third and last section is um, on where we are with positioning theory. So we'll talk a little bit about um, some, some elements of what we've uncovered about where we are today, and then uh, a little bit of a history as well. So Luke, I'm gonna turn things uh, back to you at this point. Right. <clears throat> well, the thing to state at the beginning is that Although we speak about some foundational text of positioning theory, there is no single document, no single source that presents the theory in its totality. And what we did in, in our chapter is that we gave a bit of an attempt to formulate what we think is the essence of the theory. And so it all starts with the notion of position and positioning. And here is how we can summarize this. Well, first of all, the whole idea of taking positions, of being assigned positions, of positioning yourself and others has to be related to the fact that at all times, we as human beings, as persons, we try to cope with the situation that we are into. At this moment, I'm coping with the situation of giving a lecture. That means coping in the sense of making sure that I say the thing that I have want to say, that I have to say, making sure that I can understand the technology used, et cetera, et cetera. And you as a listener are also coping with the situation. You try to understand what I'm talking about. You maybe try to prepare for asking a question and stuff like that. Coping with situations is one of the daily things that we do from the moment we wake up to the moment we go back to, to sleep. We always have to cope with the situation we are in. And that brings us to the notion of position. A position can be defined as a set of beliefs that we have about the rights and duties in any given situation that we have to cope with. 
and the related appropriateness to act, to do things, or to speak in certain ways. If I can turn to this situation right here and now, I can say almost everything I want at this moment, but nevertheless, there are things that you don't do, you, and you have to do. I, for instance, and this is my, one of my favorite examples, I'm an aficionado of Football Club Anderlecht of, uh, in Brussels, in Belgium, and I could give you an analysis of what happened yesterday when Anderlecht was playing and they were losing the game and stuff like that. But then, of course, I can do that, but I shouldn't, because you're here to listen about positioning theory, not about the adventures of my favorite football team. So it is the beliefs that we have about the rights and duties in any situation that we are dealing with. But there is another very important issue. These beliefs, these assignment of rights and duties are not absolute. They are, first of all, the things we believe that we can do and that can differ from person to person and that will differ from person to person. So a position is a set of beliefs that we have about rights and duties in any given situation. And the position then, in that way, becomes a position in a normative field of what we call, what Harry calls the moral order. And what I'm trying to say now, that it should be thought of as a moral field, that is a set of beliefs that a group of people have about the right and duties and the appropriateness to act or speak in that situation. It refers to another concept uh, coined by Ron Harry, the fact that we can divide the situations in which we uh, operate in terms of what we call episodes. And then positioning becomes the process of assigning, choosing or rejecting positions. If we are in a more interactive way of talking to each other as we are doing now, where I'm talking and you're just listening, then you can challenge at one time my position. You can say, for instance, well, you're not expl explaining clearly what it is, or you are making uh, taking advantage of your situation as being the, the, the lecture to do to talk about other lectures and stuff like that. So positioning is a process that comes from within, but also from outside. Others are positioning me at any time uh, in a certain way. And that I think is a bit the essence of the positioning theory. And that is also where it goes wrong on many occasions. We see a lot of research that is published that re makes reference to positioning theory, but they don't speak at all about the moral orders. The moral orders that operate as a field in which we can do things, we can say things, and that is a crucial element of the uh, positioning theory. Um, and with that, there comes the next positioning analysis, which means that we can try to analyze the situation of positions and positioning by asking people, by observing people, by using all the classical methods, uh, discourse analysis and whatever, uh, or possibilities. And then uh, there is the positioning triangle, which means that, and this was very beautifully um, described by Rome Harry in different um, publications, that there is a kind of triangle of what he calls mutually determined issues. And the storyline, the position, and the social forces of the speech acts of the utterances are the three elements in that. So what people say and the, the power of what they are saying is determined by the positions they take in the moral order and also by the ongoing storyline. And that's a very important attribute, which is also, in some cases, a little bit underdeveloped or forgotten in positioning theory research. That is that next to the idea that you have a position in a moral order, there is also the ongoing storyline that uh, is of importance because the storyline will tell you how the characters will evolve, how the uh, interpretation of what you're doing uh, evolves in terms of the storylines. And then, uh, do we have a next slide about the triangles, Mary? Yeah. 
this whole idea of the triangle has been uh, talked about in many different publications. Maybe, maybe you could say something here about the different things that we see on the screen. Sure, I won't go over this in, in detail because I want to be sensitive to our time, but you see a variety of representations on, on the screen. And one of the things we did was we went back through and tried to find out where was the first, where were the first appearance? So you see these various references to the triangle, the triad cited in different places. As far as we could determine the first reference to the triad with that triangular shape, um, was in 1993. It's not called the positioning triangle. That kind of came about over time and people picked that term up and started using it um, more, um, more so. So you see these, these uh, publications that are in um, this one in Van Langenhove and Hooray. And I got a good chuckle because when I was talking with Luke, he uh, this was partly his publication, right, of the Van Langenhoven Hooray chapter. And he thought that the uh, first appearance of that came somewhere later. So I was like, actually, Luke, it was in your chapter. So there are a few um, iterations of examples here that were published in various things. And again, these appear in the chapter with a little bit of history and description. And then some of the later representations as people have tried to expand this um, um, a common one that folks have used is this positioning diamond from Slocum Bradley. And again, I think Luke's point here is that a lot of times the way that, that we see these used is that they'll kind of appear in a publication. And I think I've probably been guilty of this myself, but not really digging into, okay, so why is that appearing here and what does it mean or how do we use it for analysis? There are also some really um, excellent examples of how people use this for analysis as well. And it's not the only way to enter in. I mean, um, the, in, in some of the writings that, uh, that Ram and Luke and others have done, they talk about like using different vertices of the triangle and also the point that it doesn't have to be a triangle, right? There, there could be other things such as Ram acknowledges in some of his work, you know, the issue of physical spaces, right, as well. So again, we overview some of that in the chapter and um, and I won't, I won't continue talking about that today, but it was an interesting sort of a uh, uh, bit of a scholarly sleuth work to track down where some of those things emerge from. And I think also they're emerging across different fields. So it's helpful to look across disciplines and see how people are picking things up and, and using it. Um, Luke, we're almost at 10 o'clock. So I don't know if you want to go through this uh, quickly. And then we can um, just mention the, the or show the slide about future directions and then have a little bit of time for questions or talk. Sure. Well, well, very quickly, this is actually something that comes from Ron Harry himself. It's according to my knowledge that has not been really published as such. And the reasoning is, is as follows, that in psychology, you have a lot of attention to what people can do, to the cognitive abilities that they have, to the skills that they have to perform certain things, to act. Then you have the realm of what people actually do, because not everything that you can do, you do. And then there is a third realm that Rome Harry describes as what people should do according to the moral order in play. And positioning theory is about the interaction between what people can do, what people should do, and that determines, determines uh, but in a non-causal way, what people are actually doing. And that's why he said that domain B uh, is the province of positioning theory. And that allows me to, to go back to, to Newton, because some of you might be surprised that, we, that I bring up Newton. Remember, Newton had his idea, positions, velocity, and powers that determine what happens with Ron Henry. Another way to, to, to formulate that is to say that there is a grid of reality that contain, contains, on the one hand, uh, uh, space, locations in space, and on the other hand, locations in time. And every single material object can be uh, located in that grid of uh, space and time. But for the social psychology, for the social sciences, we should 
to not think that is the most important grid. There is another grid in play. That is the grid between what people, uh, the storylines that are developing and the persons that are speaking with certain power. And instead of material things to be uh, located in that uh, grid, we can uh, locate speech acts and the power of speech acts in both uh, grids. And that is developed uh, as an idea in the, the book Varieties of Realism by, by Brom Harry. And uh, yeah, I, I will leave it with this because I see indeed that time is ticking. Thank you. Um, I, I want to em just emphasize what you said too about those um, those relationships between those areas as being non-causal. So I think sometimes people, um, I've seen people misinterpret that these positions are sort of always predictive of outcomes, but human beings always do have some choice within those storylines. We may feel our choices are constrained, or we may feel that there are more personal consequences or um, societal or cultural consequences, but there is... Um, it is non-causal, as Luke said. Uh, just to wrap up here, before we take any questions or comments, the last chapter of the handbook, uh, the, the final chapter, chapter 24, um, we did try to wrap things up, up but we also wanted to present some specific uh, directions, and this grew out of, in part, the uh, the the first chapter, which we realized there was just too much to include there, but some of the things, uh, and Luke has mentioned some of these already that are just kind of practical recommendations and future avenues to explore, um, reading broadly across foundational literature related to positioning specifically, but also the historical literature situating development of positioning theory. Uh, and there are some also wonderful um, works. Uh, there's a chapter by Maria Varelis and colleagues on science, education, and positions there where they look at both people who have used positioning theory, but also looking at positioning in general. And Michael B Bamberg's chapter talks about the metaphor of positioning and other metaphors. Um, but this is something we can all do. Um, also, I think moving beyond the citations of only early foundational texts related to positioning. The Davies and Hare text is interesting because it's an anchor text and lots of people cite it. But one of the other things we noticed is that there's a tendency to cite that text and maybe one or two you know, of the edited volumes, particularly the 1999 edited volume on positioning theory. And oftentimes there are pieces that cite very little other works. And so... Um, it's not about necessarily ticking boxes to cite, but also tracing some of those influences and trying to push ourselves to make connections and think beyond also to question. Um, reading across disciplines and seeking out works inside and outside a field of study, especially given the, the cross-disciplinary nature. Articulating and developing methodological descriptions related to positioning theories. Uh, a lot of us know that oftentimes if we're doing these qualitative interpretive works, that the part that gets short shrift in publications is the, the description of methods because it often takes a lot of extra words. And so it can be difficult to find those, but that's an area that um, we can push on and hopefully the method section of the handbook will ex, you know uh, uh, excavate some of those. And then continuing to seek dialogical engagement with positioning theory and others in the field, like what we're doing right now and also through the positioning conference, I think is another example of that. Um, so on that note, um, I am going to ask if there are any questions or comments. Uh, we do have time to take some of those. I'll leave this slide up just for um, just for a minute if you want to ponder on any of those. And we can take questions in the chat. We can also take questions uh, by um, you can raise your hand or unmute to ask a question. I'll try to, to monitor those. And yes, if you do have to sign off because it is in the middle of the night for you or you have something else to do, please um, please go ahead and, and do that. But if you want to stay around and have a little conversation um, or uh, ask a question, we'll be here for um, a few more a few more minutes.
comments or questions? I'm trying to like have a good wait time, which is always hard in Zoom because it's it, it's difficult to gauge those sometimes. Uh, Mary, can I ask a question here? Yes, absolutely, Sukhinder, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I think is uh, we are looking forward to see the handbook and <laughs> and benefit from this effort. Uh, I was wondering about uh, idea positioning, and especially when it comes to the discursive positions and then idea of materiality associated it. And uh, here I'm thinking about the idea of like, uh, as we are in the transformative world where artificial intelligence is becoming very crucial actor and artificial intelligence has a materiality behind it. So there is an engineering design because there is, and also there is a, some structural design which lies with the conceptual framework uh, with mathematics and other kind of things. And these uh, actors, whatever we call them, they are creating particular positions uh, and, uh, and shaping the reality in a particular way. How can we, uh, engage with this reality? I think uh, that is a question that I would uh, probably raise for us to think. And if there are some response, I would be very delighted to hear this. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a terrific question, Sukhandar. And I think it's one where I would welcome, I would welcome com comments too, because what, you know, what you've identified is a rapidly evolving, emerging, you know, field. It's been around for a while. It's not yeah. brand, brand new. It's just no, no. Really been thrust into center stage in the public consciousness, I think. But, and I don't have an answer about how to look at all those positions. Um, and I'm not a person who's well-versed in, in AI or the backs, you know, the systems of the <laughs> side of the engineering. But no. I think, what I what I think is interesting to think about is the the ways in which uh, positioning can be used at a variety of entry points and also um, with a variety of of lenses, right? So we can look at like users interfacing with AI and what's happening with positions in particular categories. But we could also look at a broader, you know, sort of a systems theory of like what happens with with um, different uh, engineering systems and the people in those systems and the design of this and how that that works or even on the policy side, because now there are a lot of uh, countries, um, a lot of places that are starting to try to develop policy. So I think there are probably lots of ways that that could be looked at. I think that's one of the practical utilities of of positioning, at least as as I see it, um, Luke. I don't know if you have any comments that you want to make toward that. Well, thank you very much. Very interesting and intriguing question, indeed. Uh, artificial intelligence, how to cope with it, how to deal with it. Uh, first of all, uh, if you're interested in that topic, I can recommend the book Cognitive Psychology, uh, written by Rob Harry, where he talks a lot about artificial intelligence. But secondly, the whole issue for me is indeed what kind of rights and duties we give to machines. And, and one of the things that, that keeps me busy, what I think a lot about is, can we have machines? Can they have the rights to present themselves as if they are a person? That is the crucial element of artificial intelligence and of the danger of artificial intelligence. I don't think it's about overtaking humanity because you are more intelligent no, or whatever. No. But uh, I think, on the other hand, we should also make sure that every person that is interacting with the machine should have the right to know that the machine is a machine and not a real person. But uh, it's an intriguing field. And uh, as I said, I think there can be a lot of very interesting research and positioning theory seems to be one possibility to, to do that. So, yeah. So Thanks. that's maybe not a real answer to your question, but... <laughs> Thank I you. would encourage you to, to further think about it. Yes, thank you. Other comments in response to Secunder or other questions or comments that folks want to raise? Um, thank you so much um, for um, uh, the series and, and starting the handbook uh, conversations, Mary and Luke. Um, I, I wanted to build on Ali's question and, and the answer. And 
uh, as I was hearing the question and your answers, what kind of uh, got to uh, um, a question that was interesting to me is how this idea of the moral field or the moral order changes when we think about when um, AI actors really come into play and in this, you know, thinking about um, positions and positionings as a process um, in, in, in the development of um, and the evolution of what we consider rights and, and, and duties. Right in 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 whatever interactional settings we're thinking about. So um, that was my kind of thought when I heard the question, and, um, um, and you know it is very much hot topic um, that is not new, but people have been writing and thinking about all this time. But you know uh, the times we live in made it very much. Uh, an issue that we are concerned about and think about, right? And positioning theory, I feel like, could be an, a way in which we can think about all the dimensions of what it means to uh, engage with um, AI. And my other uh, comment, as I was listening to the history, uh, thank you for that, and, and the kind of situating of the positioning theory in uh, multiple fields um, was like, um, you know, the whole idea of structure and agency and its dialectic and structuration theory and agent, ag agency, right? Uh, Margaret Thatcher's kind of work, uh, um, autogenetic kind of development of agency and how these kind of ideas about structure and agency and their dialectic relationship come to play out in multiple dimensions. Um, of uh, opposition theory constructs and right? the positions in the social forces and the storylines and the identities in a kind of shaping rights and duties. So uh, that is, I think, an area that could very much become kind of a, a way of, of, of bringing constructs, uh, sociological constructs more into the, um, in conversation with position mm -hmm. theory. And I wonder, how you both really think about and how, um, what would be kind of ways in which um, this dialectical relationship can become um, more central in, in kind of uh, some kind of conversation with positioning theory? Well, thank you for that question, uh, which is not a simple one to answer, but uh, I can <laughs> refer to the article I wrote varieties of moral orders. And where I have talked about the, the, the structure agency problem. And in, in my view, and this is perhaps where I differ a little bit from Ron Harry's thinking. Ron Harry was always saying that you have one dominant moral order that determines or influences what is done and what is said in a certain situation. I think it's more complex like that, that we have at the same time several levels of moral orders that are applicable to a situation. And in the varieties of moral orders article, I make a distinction between the cultural moral order, the civilization order on the one hand, the order that is imposed by the state that tells you what you should do, what you can do. And in, in most countries, you cannot drive on the left side or the right side, whatever. Um, then you have the organizational moral order that plays a role. Uh, and then you have the conversation of moral order. Uh, and then at the end, there is also what I believe can be pictured as the personal moral order. The things you think that you can, can do, you cannot do. And, and it's the interplay between these different types of moral orders that, that deals with what is the power of the agency and what is the power of society. And basically this goes then back to, to what I think are the two main tendencies in society. On the one hand, society needs to stimulate agency of people uh, because we need that agency to have to keep the society running, so to speak. And on the other hand, there is a kind of force that uh, societal force that deals with containing the agency of, of people. Uh, you, you cannot allow people to do everything. And it is within that dialectic, so to speak, that the uh, agency structure relationship can be uh, developed. But more about that in the varieties of moral order. 
Thank you, Luke. Um, part of my job is keeping an eye on the time and we're just about out of um, out of time. So I think actually that the question from Maria and the response from Luke is a really good point to ponder um, between our um, be, between our next uh, series. So we'll be hearing um, from in the future, we'll be hearing every month from uh, with the next set of structure, the talks is going to be two talks in one session. So we'll have we'll have the talks, and then we'll have a little bit of time at the end uh, for for those as as well. So we'll hear from two different sets of uh, chapter authors each time. And uh, as always, um, we look forward to seeing you there. If anyone has any questions at any point, you can always reach out to me. Um, my email address is very simple. It's just mcvmcvee -E at buffalo.edu. Um, luckily, there aren't very many Mary McVees around. So if you just Google that, you'll find me pretty fast too. But uh, if you have any questions about the conference coming up and information, um, we will try to be getting that out as quick as we can. And, um, and we'll send those things out um, as well as share them out in these virtual talks. So thank you so much for being here today, everybody. And thank you, Luke, uh, for your overview of the history, a so important contribution to the handbook and to this work that you and um, Ram and Bronwyn Davies and Ali started many years ago. Thank you. And thank all of you to be with us. And by the way, also to vote on the cover. I think it was <laughs> yes. <a> thank you. <laughs> thank you for voting on the cover. Yeah. Cover one, so cover one. <laughs> Yeah, I think cover one more. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Thank Bye. you. Everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.